Yo. All right. Um, I want to go back. I'm just going to... I know we only got through, like, sections one through three uh, last week. Or, yeah. And um, so I'm going to cover those real fast. One of my goals this time is that I don't want to... um, I don't want to get bogged down in a lot of um, digressions. Uh, It's really fun. But one of the things is I definitely worry that we start uh, cutting into sort of, you know, you take too long, you kind of cut into the dialectic a little bit. And that's fine, but, you know, I want to get this moving along. And I also have this other issue where, um, and I've always had this, I always get worried that, you know, we're going to miss a lot of the subtlety that someone isn't going to get it all the way on the first shot. And it's wrong, right? Like, of course, someone isn't going to get it all on the first shot. Like, who is, right? If you could, you wouldn't need to study this for a long time. You would just be, oh, I got, it, I read it once, or I heard it once, and I figured it all out. You know, so I'm not going to worry so much about that anymore. I'm just going to understand, look, like I said the first time, my goal is really that you guys become philosophers or philosophy inclined, where you want to learn things, you want to ponder ideas, uh, and not every idea, right? Like, you know, it, this is, I'm not here to, uh, okay, let me, let me phrase it this way. My goal here is for you to be primarily introduced to organized thinking, right? That's really what we're doing here in philosophy. Do you have organized thoughts? And I don't want this to turn into, oh, you know, like secondarily, I want you to have the right thoughts, Right? Because I do think Aristotle has a lot of the right thoughts. But I don't want this to turn into, I'm trying to understand this because this is gospel. Right? Like, I, I don't want this to turn into, you know, the new gospel. It's No, I want you to understand Aristotle's method, ponder his ideas. I think many of his ideas are correct and 100% right. Um, but, but the bigger strength here is that you become someone who gains the ability to have an investigative mind, who has the ability to, uh, you know, comprehend ideas that aren't necessarily yours and not be someone who's emotionally attached to every idea they have, right? That's really what it is, right? When people are, they can't understand philosophers that they don't agree with. It's not that they can't understand the philosophers that they don't agree with. It's that they're so emotionally attached to their thoughts that they think, I, I kind of colloquially call them the Gospels, right? The, the, these thoughts are the new Gospels, where it's like, this is 100% true, and I, 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 I feel pain at the mere idea of it being challenged, right? Um, I like to use an example. I've been using this example for a long time. Of uh, I like to use uh, Kant, right? I like to use Kant as an example because um, I really like him. I don't really think he's right about very much, if really anything, um, but I think he has a very interesting perspective, and I think he has some very, very coherent and compelling ideas about how to organize our sense of morality. Um, again, I don't agree with him on really most things, uh, but I think he's very important. Um, I mean, I mean, historically, he's obviously very, very important. But, um, you know, it's if you can't read someone you don't agree with or don't like, then in a certain sense, you don't have the mind of a philosopher yet. You have to be able to take ideas and not be emotionally attached to them and, uh, you know, sort of sort of be like, I can't comprehend this because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put my feet in their shoes. So, um, and that's the example I use, right? Because, you know, I mean, the people who've known me a lot longer, Kant is kind of like the opposite of everything I talk about. But, um, you know, I have a lot of respect for him. I really like him and I, I really like talking about his ideas as well. Um, so that's just sort of something to keep in mind, um, you know, as we go through this, I don't want you to, cause I've had that where I go through air solid people and they're like, yes, this is the new truth. And I'm like, well, I do think a lot of it's true, but I don't want you reading this going. And again, this is what I talked about with the dialectic, like Aristotle doesn't want you to do that either. He doesn't want you to go. Aristotle, what are the propositions I should believe? And then he just makes a list and you go, got it. I believe all these now. He wants you to go, let's work through these ideas and see what holds up. 
because as people who read book one, he starts off with a very specific idea, right? About, um, you know, do we like think that everybody has to have lived a whole life to be happy? Where you're only the dead are happy and only the dead that lived good lives are happy. And he's like, let's just go with that because that's what everybody believes. But then later, as you noticed, right? Later in book one, what does he say? He goes, well, you know what? That idea actually doesn't work anymore because if that's true, then what's the point of talking about being happy right now? Right? There isn't actually... If, if it's true that you can't be happy in this life, then there, we have to sort of stop and go, there's nothing left to talk about, right? The, the, whole, the whole question of what makes a man happy is, is pointless, um, you know, back in section 10. Uh, this is why I kind of always cringe a little bit when someone goes, Aristotle believed you couldn't be happy until you were dead. And I'm like, did you think that because somebody told you that who's like, I can't comprehend Aristotle except by scanning his work and like just looking for positive, you know, uh, for positively affirmed propositions and then going, oh, this must be what Aristotle believed. It, it's, it's, it's sort of shocking because even people I have a lot of respect for, I'll see them repeat this and I'm like, okay, I don't want to be mean, but I can just tell you haven't read Aristotle or haven't read him deeply, right? And it's like you, you're just kind of going off of another respected scholar that you're citing. Um, so you see what I'm saying? It's This is kind of the whole point of what we're doing here is I want you to have that kind of mental, uh, I think Sachs calls it this at one point, he says it's a, he phrases it as like you deprive yourself of the mental agility that comes with comprehending Aristotle as Aristotle wants you to understand him. Where if I just tell you the things, you don't really learn it, but if you, learn it this sort of by reasoning by being walking through the reason walking through the reasoning it becomes your knowledge right and you become more capable more more intelligent uh more expansive as a human so that's where i just wanted to say that real fast so i'm gonna just kind of recover the first three sections real fast um minus the dialectic which is probably 40 minutes sorry minus the digressions right which is like the which, you know which is a. Uh, 40 minutes of uh, the last lecture, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> no dialectic, just digressions. That, that, that's exactly right. That was the first lecture. So second lecture, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna I'm going to try to be better. Um, all right. Uh, I'll just real, recap real fast. Section one, this is mostly Aristotle trying to... Um, Lay the, lay the basic assumption for, uh, you know, the, why are we, you know, there is a definitive reality to sort of the aims of things, uh, specifically human action, right? There's this, this kind of definitive start of human action that when, when we do stuff, we try, you know, there, there's some point to it or there's some point to these arts that humans uh, practice that we want something out of it, right? If you build houses, right, an architect wants to build, house, build buildings, a house homemaker wants to make homes, you know, a doctor wants to heal people. There's some point to it. And this point goes backwards and says, is that art? Why does that art? Uh, how do we define what that art even is? Well, we know what doctoring is because if it leads to more health, it's good medicine. If it doesn't, it's bad medicine. It's not real doctoring, whatever. Um, and I, I know I gave a, it's not really a digression. It's just a warning that this is where you start to see when you gotta to go to other people, other scholars, other sort of modern pop philosophy, they sort of abuse this word telos, right? Telos, telos, however you want to anglicize it. They they abuse that word, and the thing I, I the, the little lecture I gave you was that it doesn't really mean the psychological, uh, the psychological implication that they want to use it as, because um, and definitely the, the the scholastics and the modern Thomists do this a lot where they take this word and they take it and start applying it to everything in a way that doesn't make a lot of sense where it's like, um, and I, I kind of cited Edward Fazer, who's someone I really like a lot, where he will mix psychological intent with the sort of 
definitive reality of like a dog and then the definitive uh you know sort of definitive reality of like a, a ball like a bouncy ball or a hammer or something and the problem is these three things are all very different on a different metaphysical like have very different metaphysical ontology and metaphysical implications um which is uh, like i said it's, it's a very it's that's going to be a very big deal because a hammer does not exist in the same way a dog exists right um you know because dogs dogs have their their own being that is defined by this power inside of them a hammer doesn't really have any of that right a hammer is a hammer because we think it's a hammer like you know it's kind of like the philosophy if no one is in the you know no one hears a tree fall as a sound being made well in this case the answer is kind of no right if there's no humans in the room is it still a hammer well not really no it's not it, it never and it's because it never really was anything in the first place it's just this kind of thing we define and then thirdly the kind of like conflating it with psychological intention right i intend to do this thing is very different uh when i'm thinking this um intellectually compared to um you know uh compared to sort of how a dog exists hang on give me one second guys and we will pick right back up um so yeah I, I this isn't really digression it's just going to be very important for moving forward that um you know i don't i don't as we progress through this there for some of you there is going to be a little bit of that um up chucking action going on where you're going to be like wait i was already introduced to this idea but in a different context with different implications and that's one of them here aristotle here is really just talking about um there's a kind of human intention intentionalism to these arts we do and these arts have a a thing that defines all of the action and that's what he's laying out here in this first section right um you know we're, we're trying to find what is this art that is going to be all encompassing uh he moves into section two um you know he's like well all these things seem to be for the good of society and and they're all contained within studying the city because you have to kind of understand everything else and um you know he talks about it, it would appear then that this this highest art is politics right the art of the polis the science of the polis and it's it, you know the art of the people and um and, and that's kind of it's a it's a very quick conclusion um but it, but it kind of makes sense that whatever it is that manages all human there has to be an art that manages all human activity and he thinks it's politics because that manages all humans um right and uh he has that great line politics is uh it deals with universal since we don't say what's good for a man but all men right it's a great line um section three um he goes well let's let me stipulate really fast uh you know we have to stipulate um that there are certain people who aren't going to be useful here right um young people he you know he calls out young people right young people don't learn anything from philosophy uh but then he kind of goes it's just because young people are so you know impulsive they have all these other desires they don't really want to learn they just want to win arguments or they just want to fight people or they just want to you know get with girls or uh or men right if you're a girl right because <laughs> i yeah, just you know um it, it, it's like you know there's all these kind of things and he goes but you know really we mean um you know really what we mean is that uh it's just these impulsive people because as he points out tragically sometimes old people are also impulsive and um you know they're also impulsive and and out of control and have all these same traits too so it's not really useful for them either and that's really what we're getting at um so so if you're not really prepared for philosophy like if you're just looking for the wrong things um <laughs> that was the low-hanging fruit sir <laughs> that i was avoiding <laughs> so you guys could do it though um you know and so it's um you know if, if you're not really prepared for philosophy if you're not someone where philosophy is going to be really useful to you um this is kind of a worthless pursuit uh, moving on to section four we're talking about happiness now um and that kind of this is where the the start of the book really starts right it really starts cooking is because he's like okay so we're trying to study politics well what is everything like so politics is about the art of the people and it's about you know 
why are we making horseshoes and it's to be a better horseman and saddles and we want horsemen because horses are good for war and why do we go for war well it's to preserve the city and well why are we preserving the city why are we healing people why are we doing well it's because there there's something about us that we we want something for its own end there's this kind of satisfaction we want out of life that all these arts belong to and and he and so he 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 says well it, it seems to be happiness right it's but and, and of course this is another one of those words that gets like abused really badly by people where they go aristotle didn't mean happiness was the same as having an ice cream cone you know this is like the this is that like you know hillsdale college kind of like youtube short take right happy aristotle says eudaimonia and that's means happiness but it doesn't just mean you know it doesn't just mean that you're happy because you got an ice cream cone it means that you are very satisfied in life and and, and that's not yeah it's the prager you take right and it, it, it's it's I, I i i you know what i gotta respect the effort because the effort it's trying to give you is that what they're trying to say is that there is a difference between the physical sensation of pleasure and the transcendent sort of spiritual reality of the human you know of the, the the soulful reality of the human experience in which pleasure comes out of that right um the sense of pleasure the sense of something being pleasing but what aristotle is trying to say here is that um because eudaimonia right it, it's basically means like uh like a higher spirit right the like the 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 better state of the spirit what he's trying to what he's trying to point out here is that it, he's trying to say that like th there seems to be something ab above and beyond any kind of like specific goal that humans want more than anything but we also start to get confused all right and we're going to get into this because in section four this is what he starts talking about is that he goes well but in a weird way it seems we can assign in our heads, right, in a, in a kind of subjective way, we can think of, of happiness as being the product of different things. But here's the problem, right? Here's the impasse we're at. Does that mean anything can be happiness? Well, the answer seems manifestly no, because some people's answer to happiness seems really, really bad. <laughs> they don't seem happy at all. And that's very interesting, right? Because this is, I, I always love bringing this up because um, it's like a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that right off the bat, Aristotle's saying, no, there's a definitive happiness. And Aristotle's instead saying, he's going up to the person who goes, uh, what's your happiness? What's your truth? And he's going, okay, let's run with this idea. You can decide what your happiness is. Well, are there better answers and are there worse answers? Well, it seems just upon examination, there are very obviously better answers and very obviously worse answers. And this is what he starts going into, right? Uh, happiness is it's this great dispute. What will bring them happiness? And he goes, um, well, it would seem then that some forms, some objects as happiness are much more proper to the word, right? Um, like one of the things he brings up is a kind of perpetualness, a kind of self-containedness. If, if I'm saying happiness is coming from some kind of spiritual reality and you're saying happiness is coming from eating ice cream cones, well, I seem to be having a better life because I can be spiritually good all the time and you stop being happy the second you run out of ice cream cones, right? And so it seems like there's just obviously better and worse answers here. Um, which is what he wants to he wants to run up to. Um, he introduced this idea. You've probably all heard me say this before. It's a very important idea. Uh, desire implies poverty. It's going to be very important because this is a, a huge th theme through a lot of Aristotle's ideas. That desire is this force in which you are moved to acquire something. Right? You desire it. You want to bring it to you. You want it in some way. And but but desire really only exists insofar as you are impoverished of it right you can't desire something in if you already have it that doesn't make any sense right you now reflect on it you you contemplate it you use it right and so um this is just a very important idea here 
Um, he, it's a he, it's a kind of a, a small line here, but this is going to be ongoing, uh, just as he makes later deductions, and I think it's a hundred percent accurate, um, even at the highest theological levels, because um, I, again, no, you know what, no digressions. Um, let's see here. So uh, people say happiness is all kinds of things, right? It's, oh, it's this. It's ice cream cones. It's fast cars. You know, it's blah, blah, blah. And he goes, but but we don't need to look at everything. If we can kind of just look at, if we can figure out like sort of categories, um, you know, if we can sort of figure out categories that we can start lumping stuff into, we can kind of examine this. And, and he goes, if you start looking at, um, you know, if you start looking at the various claims, right, we can kind of start summing them up. You know, oh, this guy thinks that eating ice cream cones is happiness. This guy thinks doing cocaine is happiness. This guy thinks, you know, buying, you know, old 50-year-old muscle cars is happiness. He's like, well, that's just all stuff. Like, you're just kind of consuming stuff at this point, right? You're just, you're, you're consuming stuff. And so, you know, after a brief kind of uh, introduction Aristotle has about, you know, deduction... Uh, you know, how do we move towards first principles or away from them, um, which is kind of him establishing that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, to induce these, uh, these kind of first principles out of the basic human experience, right? Um, this is kind of where the first, like, if you're a young person who doesn't understand precision in philosophy, you're going to have a hard time because you're going to be like, well, hang on a minute, we need to all stop and we all need to all stop and, and deduce what can we really know in this world. That's like a very modern philosophy thing. Aristotle doesn't do that, right? He just goes, I can just I can just kind of recognize by looking around me that there are things to know. And, you know, not everything is starts from, you know, these like we, we like mathematically deduce stuff. Sometimes it's just us looking around and noticing, hey, you know. Hey, the, everybody who does this is happy, and everybody who doesn't do it isn't happy. Um, and so, so this is kind of the first, like, here's like our second big filter for people who don't want to understand Aristotle is that if you're sitting there going, uh, I think you know, I just saw, cited Phaser. Phaser in another talk actually has this really great line where he jokingly says, um, he calls it throat clearing, where if you want to talk about something, you have to first <clears throat> throat clear and be like, oh, let's um. Actually, uh, let me explain why I think we can know stuff. Like, right, there is none of that with Aristotle. It's like, no, we. If you if you're really confused about how we can know people around us don't like to eat dog poop, then with all due respect, you're either immature or an idiot or both. Like, you don't have any place in philosophy. Um, so he, so after a little bit of that, right? After a little bit of explaining, it, we we jump into, um. You know, who should we be listening to? He makes a few comments about that. We need to trust people who can uh, have lived good lives, who do live good lives, right? Um, so Because we want them to be familiar with these things. Uh, this is actually something that's kind of funny because people think of it as like, it, like I, I kind of laugh because it's like, uh, you know, we, we, there's that kind of joke where it's like, oh, you don't listen to this guy because he's a giant pervert. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, that's not intellectually honest. I'm like, actually, but it is wisdom wise. It's, it's very honest that if you're like a, a giant weirdo, you probably are going to have very weird ideas. Um, and this isn't universally true because there are some weirdos out there who actually do have profound ideas. But ironically, we know they're profound because then other people we do trust, right? This kind of proving aerosol, right? People who we do trust with good lives say that they're normal. Um, so in essence, they have to outsource their uh, their credibility, right? Um, and so that's what Aristotle is talking about. Let's look for people who can make good judgments, who are raised well or are well or are good people or whatever. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, there is that kind of interesting thing here that Aristotle actually believes that there is a connection between being a good person and intelligence in a profound sense. Um, and he will definitely expand on that later. Um, but as Catholics, we actually all know this already, right? Because Catholics live and die with the claim, sin darkens the intellect, which Aristotle will very much delve into later. 
um, and it's very cool. Uh, back on back to where we were, um, Aerosol saying there's these categories of things people want out of life, um, or what they claim makes them happy. And he goes, well, let's look at this. And he goes, we can really kind of boil it down to these um, kind of categories. And he goes, um, you know, eating ice cream cones, doing cocaine, uh, casual organ damage, right? <laughs> As Matt said, casual organ damage. These are all kind of what he calls the life of pleasure, right? That, that people think the life of pleasure is what's going to bring them happiness. That if they can just kind of maximize sort of the, the pleasing aspect of, of sort of things, usually the physical body, the consumption of stuff, he's like, this will. This is what happiness is. Happiness is is eating well and drinking well and unhappiness is uh, not having those things. And he, Aristotle says, well, right off the bat, this can't possibly be the answer to human happiness because animals do this, right? Dogs are happy when they sit there and, uh, you know, they sit there and they eat food and they lay in the ground and they just sleep on grass all day. And, and Aristotle says, well, this is really the life of cattle, right? Because this is what cattle do. They just kind of stand there and they just kind of cook in the sun and they just eat grass all day and they drink water and they lay down and they don't really do anything. And they just kind of are sitting there being pleased with eating food and, and not, you know, not doing anything. And so he goes, this just this can't be the answer to the to the life. This can't be the answer to human happiness. Because if it is, then there really is no human happiness. It's just animal happiness, and that's all there is to life. But that obviously doesn't work because we're not asking that. We're asking what's human happiness. And we're asking for happiness that, as Aristotle is going to talk about, it's lasting. Right? We want happiness that's lasting and transcendent and is contained within the person and so of course you know if someone were to try to rebut this by going no what if i don't believe in all those things well aristotle's already talked about that that's fine you can say that you can say you don't believe in it you don't whatever but that's ironically your choice and that's what he's saying there's a bunch of choices we can make here what do we choose to believe gives us happiness and you can choose that but the question is is that going to bring you happiness because i'm going to make a different choice and we're going to have an empirical out, out, you know, we're going to have an empirical result here. I'm going to go and be happy in this like perpetual transcendent way that gives more pleasure because it's, it's a pleasure that can't be taken from me. And it's beyond all these things. And you're going to go live your life. And then when you're sitting there and you can't get more morphine, you're going to be like, wow, I was taking the, the matrix. I was in the matrix. I was taking the, the, the sleeping pills. And you're, you know, you're over there living this transcendent life into eternity of good things that last forever and all this stuff. And it's like, it's like even if you say, oh, well, I don't believe in it. Well, that's your choice. And that's what Aristotle's saying. It's your choice. But one of us is going to like our choice. One of us is going to get what we want out of our choice. And one of us isn't. You you think you're choosing that because you want happiness. I think I'm choosing it because I want happiness. I'm actually going to get it. You're not going to get it. And that's kind of the answer to that, which is really funny. It's it's when you really sit down and read Aristotle, you realize that a lot of these ideas are are sort of so airtight that you can't really argue against them unless you just haven't thought about it. Um, so, so we're scratching that off the list, right? The life of cattle, not off the list. Um, the next one, because he goes, it seems a little better, is the life of honor, right? Because as he points out, a lot of great men think this is the best way to live, is that you want to be honored by people. You want to do things that bring you honor from others. And, you know, Aristotle talks about there's something true to that, right? If you act well, good men will honor you. So that seems to, you know, this seems to be more lasting because you can ha always have your honor, so to speak, right? Even if you're dying, you're, oh, I'm still, I know I'm honored by people, by this, by people. But there's a problem here for Aristotle, which is honor is still external to you. It's dependent on what others are willing to give you. And that can't really be what happiness is because if it's really happiness, that is going to sort of be profound. It can't be something that others can just take from you. Right? It can't just be something that someone just grabs you and just, bah, now you're not happy anymore because you have stripped, I've taken your honor away. I've lied. I've slandered you. I've lied about you. I've attacked your reputation behind your back. Right? Like, if, if, if what you, if you think life of honor is happiness, well, now you're going to be unhappy because someone's, you know, ripping it all from you. They're taking it all from you. And so, 
while this life is better than the life of cattle for all the reasons said, right? It's good men will think well of you. You'll probably do things that are higher and less debased. It's still not, right? It would still not be the answer. So this leaves us with one category, although it's kind of two, but he he bunts he punts one, right? Bunt, punt. It's kind of funny when you think about it. You know, he punts one where he goes, it would seem then what he's calling virtue, the life of virtue, right? The life of moral, moral excellence would appear to be the last remaining life. But then notice he has like a sentence where he goes, well, we'll talk about contemplation later. <laughs> it's like, wait, wait a minute. Isn't that answer number four? It's like, well, no, we're going to throw that down the field. And we'll get back to that because that's actually the, that's the big money. Like that's the, woof, that's the, that's what everything in Aristotle's philosophy is aiming towards is actually getting to connecting virtue to this higher moral reality, contemplation, this higher metaphysical reality, and then God, right? I'll give you a little spoiler alert because it's, it's the most profound part of Aristotle's reasoning is that the capstone of all his thoughts, right? The capstone of all his thoughts ends with him real showing that the highest human life, the, the the source of true happiness, is in fact contemplating God, because that's what God's doing. And so when you're doing what God's doing, there's this likeness inside your intellect that is the likeness of God. And now you're connected to this e- the eternal source of everything. And he talks about like it's the best life it's the best lived life and it's like that's what all virtue turns out to be because virtue ends up being this you know a lot of people kind of absolutely mangle this right where they absolutely mangle what virtue is and we'll get to that later um where they 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 talk about virtue as habit and um you know it's just it's very it's very not sort of accurate to sort of what aristotle's talking about like virtue is this power there's this intellectual virtues and these moral virtues, but ultimately it's, it's vir- it, the virtues are powers of discernment. And really all this is going to come down to living lives and spreading lives that allow uh, this ability for man to con- start to rise up and contemplate God um, and, and then become like him in the mind and, or in the soul. And then this is why your soul has this sort of like transcendent happiness is because it's, uh, it's sort of joining in God's internal activity. Um, and as Catholics, you're probably like, well, this all sounds familiar. (laughs) I think I know a little about these things. Um, and this is of course why when you're done with Aristotle, you walk into the gospels and you're just like, your mind's blown. You're just like, this is it. This is it. God became man and bridged all these gaps. Aristotle says we couldn't fill on our own. That's very potent stuff. Um, so we'll move on from that. So Aristotle goes, this third category seems to be the answer. This life of virtue. This is really what we want um and this is if you someone goes well this kind of life of moral excellence is what makes me happiness suddenly there's so many things that make sense all of a sudden um because people who do this uh their happiness is is inside of them their happiness is not this uh thing that others could just take from them whenever they want you know it's it's sort of it's perpetual it's transcendent um and there we go so, uh, section six, um, section six is really funny because a lot of people, this is kind of the first taste when they realize that, um, we're not just sort of talking about, um, you know, that there is a technical tradition that Aristotle is coming out of that, um, for a long time in ancient literature, if nobody really talked about Aristotle, if they referenced him, they referenced him as being of Plato's school. Right, Plato was kind of the big guy. He just was philosophy for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, and so this is what Aristotle is coming at. He's he, he's like, we need to talk about the idea of the good as a form first, because before we can move forward, I have to deal with this elephant in the room, which is everybody um, is 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 sort of stuck in this Platonic idea of forms, and so that must mean there is a form of the good, and. Um, He first kind of throat clears a little bit by going, well, hang on a minute. I just want to say, you know, I'm about to blow Plato out of the water, but I just want everyone to know that it's because I really like him and friends 
won't let friends be wrong on things, right? And so you're actually being nice to your friends by being truthful, and the truth is more important than hurt feelings, right? So that's what he says first, right? And then he goes, all right, let's just talk about why the form of the good just, it doesn't work, right? Um, there is a lot of going on, right? Uh, the first talk, as you have good as forms, um, if all forms are equal, there's no way of distinguishing between them when something is itself or something belongs to the thing, right? Um, uh, you know, in metaphysics, Aristotle, he makes a threefold distinction over how we can attribute uh, being to a thing. Uh, there's that kind of, um, you know, the, the, the being belongs to the thing itself, right? Uh, which is sort of like we're going to use the dog example. The dogness belongs to the dog. Uh, we can attribute it's kind of an equivocal way that you can attribute it, like hair, right? That um, th there is no such thing as hair. It might sound funny. It's like, well, what do you mean by that? There's always something's hair. So you have a dog's hair or human's hair, right? Or or you know whatever, and and it's like or and then even more specifically, you have Bona Monkey's hair and you have John's hair and you have Serve's hair. It's like it, it hair doesn't really have its own being, right? There's there's no existence to hair on its own. It just, it belongs to something. It's really funny because um. I really I said this once because I the, the example I use is I go imagine this imagine you were uh, walking down a pathway right walking down a pathway and you see a hand a, a you know a, a human hand on in the middle of the trail your first thought isn't is this a wild hand your first thought is what and then I remember just he said um he just blurted out he goes I said what would you say and he goes I would he's like he just goes I'd say or you know, he just blurts out, whose hand is this? So like you already understand there's this equivocal relationship to existence. You, you don't sit there and go, is this a hand that you just find in the wild? It's like, no, it has to belong to someone. There's no such thing as a hand that doesn't belong to someone. So, um, and, and so there's a second, you know, equivoc equivocal existence. And then, and then there's this last existence, which he calls uh, analogical existence, right? Well, he doesn't call it that, but well, it, it kind of, but you know, we say analogical because we're translating it the English, <laughs> right? Um, where we talk about something as if it's a thing, but it's not really. And he used the example of a hole in wood in like a board. So if you have a board and you go, oh, there's a hole in it. Well, we talk about hole like it's a thing, it's a noun, but there's actually nothing there. There's no such thing as a hole in any, in any sort of real way. Um, and so it's, it's very funny because, um, you know, once you try to get that down, you suddenly realize, oh, okay. So like there's different ways we reference something as, uh, as existing. Um, and so uh, with that sorted out, um, we talk about the universal form of the good. Um, but we have a problem here because we would say, in what way are we saying the good exists then? Is it its own thing? Is it something that always belongs to others? It, or is it nothing at all? It's just kind of the thing. And then he goes... Well, whatever your answer is to that, we have these impasses. Because if it's its own thing, then how can anything be good? It just There's just the good, and it's just kind of floating around on its own. If it exists as part of something else, then we have another problem, which is, does that just mean it has like a, a, a covalent existence along with absolutely everything, right? Because how do we distinguish between the good of a man, as we've already done, and the good of a dog? Or if it's like an artifact, right, like the good of a hammer, how do we even have psychological intention? Maybe it's all illusory then. Um, and so um, that's sort of what he's going through, right? He talks about um, if you kind of argue, well, maybe the good only applies to certain kinds of things. He goes, well, we've sort of, um, all we've done is kind of just added an extra step to this problem of uh, equivocation of what the good means, um, right? Like he talks about how... Um, uh, Right, this one shifts perfectly on step. You have to demonstrate that all goods in themselves are the same, the same way that two whites have the same whiteness, but this is obviously not the case. Um, we talked about whiteness. Uh, that's actually kind of funny. It's this thing lost in translation, but what he really means is uh, white skin versus the color of uh, tarnished metal. You might go, what? Well, in ancient Greek, uh, these were just the, he just considered these the same color. Like, um, you know, 
when when ste- when like metal gets tarnished, it becomes like gray. It's like they, they just called that white, or what we translate as white. And then like light skin is just called white. Just it's all the same. Like it just means like lightness. And so you say so it's all just kind of lightness. Um, and so it's like it's obvi- you know, but this is obviously not the case, right? Um, so he you know, and, and he points out, um, you know. Uh, that the, the, the sort of platonic ideas of goodness, um, they don't really work. There can't be a goodness substance that is just kind of like, if it's like, if it's, if it's, if, if it's its own thing, then it can't, nothing can really be good or bad. It's just because goodness is just kind of floating out there. If it like starts belonging to something, he's like, well, it's like kind of like paint, right? Where it's like, oh, you put goodness paint on it, but now you have a problem because the goodness isn't really part of the thing it's this it's still this thing that is just kind of nebulous um and um you know and, and so he says we have to sort of think of things being good as something entirely different maybe even sort of analogical where it's like that there's something we talk about goodness as its own thing but maybe there really isn't anything as goodness there's a thing being good but goodness doesn't belong to anything and this is going to be important because what he kind of pins down later is um what he pins down later is um you know the these ideas about uh you know a, a th- goodness is a term we use for when a thing is uh existing as itself in the way it's supposed to exist and i mean this is a massive part of uh metaphysics so we will definitely be talking about that later. So now we're on 1.7. Let me take a quick little break. Let me get some water. I'll be right back in 20 seconds. And we're back, gentlemen. Sorry about that. It's just for some reason it's decided to be hot today. <sighs> yeah, it's stencil. You know what? I should, uh, I got, you know what? I, it's, uh, I hate eating salads. This is why I trust Field of Greens. <laughs> um... <laughs> So, okay, we're back at 1.7. All right, we're 40 we're 45 minutes in. Let's speed speed round. Um Aristotle starts pulling the drawstring here, right? All these ideas he's kind of he's kind of set up um you know, uh you know, what we look at question what do we do things for the sake of activities? We don't want it for its own sake but for some end. The flute, right? Doesn't play the flute for its own sake but to make music and for the sake of hearing music and feeling pleasure from it then what do we want that for because we think it's going to bring us happiness um yeah. happiness seems to stand alone right whatever it is there has to be and this is a big part of the reasoning right everything seems to be done for there's like you know activities exist in progressions what's the ultimate end happiness uh is is sort of it has to be an end it's it's not done for anything else it's kind of like pleasure <laughs> Or honor, right? <laughs> we um, like we don't want honor for some other thing. We just want honor. We just want to feel good. Happiness is like that, right? Um, you know, even things like virtue, right? It's the question of is virtue going to make us happy? We're, you know, happiness. It has to be complete in the sense that if it's sort of the ultimate end, then there can't be something that's added to it. Because if that's the case, then happiness isn't what we're doing it for. It's this other thing, right? So invent some word, right? X, you know, X, Y, and Z. If you do happiness uh, and you go, but happiness is even better if you have X, Y, and Z, then Aristotle would say, well, then we're not really doing it for the sake of happiness. We're doing it for the sake of X, Y, and Z because that's more complete. So so this has to be sort of the final, the buck stops there, right? Um, it's what's most choice worthy in life. All actions are done for its own sake. Um and um, and and he, and, he, and he kind of points out that um, in a weird way, as funny as it is, that the question of what makes us happy is so disputed, right? Some people think it's ice cream cones. Some people think it's virtue. But as he points out, strangely, this idea that it's all done for that sake, this isn't really disputed. Everybody knows this. Like nobody disagrees with that. Everything is going to be aimed towards this ultimate end. Um, you know, we have to sort of get rid of uh, these narratives um, about sharing it with animals, right? What's nutritive? Um, man's, he talks about man's, 
rationality is truly what is unique as far as you can tell but it goes deeper than that right it's not just merely rational thought but it's um he talks about speech that and he doesn't really mean speech he means this idea that man man's rational power has this reflective part to it it has this contemplative part to it where it's able to sort of you know talk about its own ideas it's able to reflect on its own ideas. It's able to generate ideas and then reflect on those ideas, um, which is very unique because even if there are other rational beings, it would be very interesting if they could do that. And it kind of in modern science, we kind of think about that where it's like, oh, well, we know dogs dream. So they're obviously thinking about stuff, but are they rational? And the answer is um, very obviously, no, they're not rational um, whatsoever. Um, so... Um, you know, very fascinating, very fascinating stuff, right? AI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, even if it gives the appearance of it's doing what a human does, it, it's absolutely not the same thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, something about reasoning, our ability to reason is important, has to do with our actions. Um, actions are in accord with right reason. Uh, so, so this is actually really funny because this is where he uh, points really specifically, right? Where it's like, um, he, he talks about this thing where he goes, uh, this is kind of the first case where you'll see um, what I talk about uh, Sachs as a good translator because Sachs is able to point out where... Um, Aristotle is using a term, in this case, ergon, he's using it in a kind of technical way as opposed to the very normal uh, Greek usage of the word. Because remember, it's just, a, it's just I, I already said in the first lecture, it's a word that, that just kind of means like work or like putting effort onto something. It's a normal word. You say it for everything, right? I'm going to build this thing. I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to go, work, you know, the, it's like, it's, it's a very common word, but Aristotle uses it in a very, uh, like I said, neologistical way in his time, at least. Um, and so, uh, you know, what he kind of points out here is then that, well, let's define what exactly we're talking about. And he goes, where we talk about a virtue, which is, he's going to, he's going to further define, uh, he's going to further explore in the next book. But what he, he sort of point out here is that he's like, <clears throat> um, there has to be something about action and the reason, and then more on that, the right reason. And he's going to call this virtue, right? So when you act in accordance with right reason, and it doesn't just mean any single act, but what he calls the soul is being at work, right? Anyone who did my metaphysics stuff, it's like, you know, dun, dun, dun. Like, it's like this is, oh, he's saying the word. He's saying the magic word. It's like, it's a, it's like a big thing. The soul is being at work with right reason. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, and so now, you know, this is, becomes a habit. One swallow does not make a spring, right? He's referencing one sight of the bird in spring does not imply spring has shown here. It's only when all the swallows show up. Um, likewise, he's saying it's, it's, when, it's not just when you make this right decision at one time. It's when the soul goes, I will always make the right decision. Um, and that's sort of uh, kind of the most complete form of what he says is virtue. Um, although, again, he's going to start talking more about this what is a virtue what is the will what do we mean we mean virtue in two ways and then one of those ways we mean it in two other ways um but for now this is kind of good enough this is what we mean by virtue living in a way in which your soul wants the right things for the right reason and you know the right reason and you choose to do the right reason and that's living in virtue so we have our answer bop 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 this is what's going to make you happy. If you think happiness is being someone who makes the right human decision at the right time for the right reasons and thinks about human things, you're going to be happy and it's not going to be taken from you. It's going to be complete. There's nothing else to do. Um, it's going to be perfect and everything will make sense. Well, section 1.8, um, he, uh, he kind of brings up some stuff about like, there, you know, uh, there's something very fascinating here that when you start having true ideas, true ideas start to connect to other true ideas and false ideas form contradictions. And so for Aristotle, this is this is the heart of why impasses, we look for impasses in our philosophy. 
um, to find out what's true. Because if there's an impasse, then it really can't be true. In that, because um, you know, if it's a true thing, then it'll exist alongside every other true thing. Uh, but if it's a false thing, then it's going to suddenly uh, cause problems with other false things, right? Contradictions. Things cannot, you know, the the principle of non-contradiction kind of macroed up into this that that, that, that if things are contradictory, then one of them just has to be false, right? Um, very interesting idea here. Um, you know, ad hoc, this ad hoc answers are useless. Um, uh, let's see here. You, you like to be happy, not merely have them. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is a, I love this one. This is a huge thing you've heard me talk about. Aristotle here in 1.8 deals with, um, he deals with, uh, you know, th there's this idea. Is it right here? Yeah, let me show. Um, he starts touching upon that thing I talk about, like there's no secret people inside of you, right? Um, like if you're like, oh, I want to be like, I'm a just person. I have the form of justice in me. It's like, well, you have to actually do just thing. Or yeah, he talks about, it was over here. Yeah. Um, you know, this is an idea that he's going to start talking about in, uh, you know, that, that there is this kind of thing. A just person has to do just thing. Um, right here. Um, there has to be a, a, a way for people to actually do just things. So you can't be a just person if you don't do just things. You can't be a courageous person unless you do courageous things. He has this really great line, right? I love this line, right? We say it a lot. We don't crown the strongest in the city. We crown the strongest who shows up to the games, right? Um, in a certain sense, you can't just claim to have a virtue. It has to actually manifest, inside in actual actions and your actions are a reflection of what you have this is why you see me always freak out when someone goes well he's a good person at heart he just did all this horrible stuff it's like no he did horrible stuff he wants to be a horrible person it's like <laughs> it's it's sort of baffling to me like this is why i always I, it drives me absolutely nuts when people do this when they like will do something and then claim oh but you know it's not you know it's not what it looks like it's not i didn't mean to do that i mean it's like well no, you meant to do exactly what you did. That's why you did it, right? And of course, Aristotle later talks about what the difference is between acting in ignorance and acting in this. But for the most part, this is why it's always uh, super baffling, right? Where it's just like uh, people are really obsessed with this, this idea that um, like you can, you can just claim to have a certain sort of state, right? Oh, I'm a virtuous person. Uh, I have these virtues, you know, usually it's like, cause I have these tender feelings. I feel about stuff. And it's like, no, no, no. If, if you don't do courageous things, you're not a courageous person. Or, or say like, if you do really wicked things, right? If you steal a lot, then you're a thief. You can't go, well, I'm not really a thief. I'm just this. It's like, no, you're stealing things cause you're a thief. That's definition. How do you become a thief? By stealing things, by doing thief things. It's the same way, right? When people are like, uh, oh, this guy is like, oh, I'm going to be like really loud. I'm going to be braggadocious. It's like, oh, but I'm not really trying to, you know, I'm not really trying to get everyone's attention. It's like, no, you are. That's why you walked into the bar swaggering because that's the kind of person you are. So, so you sort of, you, you, it's sort of, there's sort of an irrelevancy here to claiming that your internal state is not what is dictating your outer actions. Um, you know, and this is just very important for people where it, when people are like, oh, why do, why do people view me as this? Why do they think I'm a liar? Well, probably because you lie a lot. And then in your head, you might tell yourself, well, I don't really lie, uh, you know, or I just told a couple lies. It was for a good reason. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. The simple fact is you're a liar. And that's something you have to come to terms with. If you don't want to be a liar, then don't lie. Right. Um, and so aerosols point that out. Right. You can't just claim to be the, the strongest dude. Right. Sir, if you bring it up one more time, I'm kicking you out of the group. Stop bringing up that freaking game. <laughs> and so what's going to happen is, um, you know, what's going to happen is that, you know, we love talking about this, um, especially so much of us are into fighting games, right? Where it's like the people will talk a lot of smack and then never go to tournaments, never go to weeklies, never, never do anything. And it's like, bro... You, if you want to be considered good, you have to go do what the good people do, which is they go and they beat people and they, uh, you know, win stuff. And so, you know, it, it's it's kind of funny 
um, because, it, like I said, this is just a massive, massive ongoing issue. Even today, it's just very common in people's psychology where they want to be viewed as things and then not actually do that thing, right? Um, very interesting stuff, uh, very powerful stuff. If you want to be a certain person, then go do what those people do. Um, simple as. Um, and then I guess the corollary is don't do what people who aren't like that don't do, I guess you could say. I probably had too many negatives in there, but who cares? Let's move on. We have five minutes. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, he's addressing the whole idea that... Um, uh, the word is carefully, presumably, uh, right now you only need enough precision to talk about virtue of the good life. Ultimately, Aristotle is going to reject this because it becomes true that this means happiness is not self-sufficient. And we'll get to that. Um, I've seen people, reputable people, blah, blah, blah. What are my notes here? Here's something specific. Um, the, the big takeaway from this is that if you have the, if you have a sense of the virtue, it will manifest in your actions. If you're a just person, when you have a chance to be just to others, you will be just. Simple, straightforward, but incredibly tin, incredibly, uh, you know, controversial. Um, but remember that he's saying you have to do the things to be virtuous and then be happy. Now, because like I said in the notes, point out this is part of the dialectic because he's going to reject this idea partially uh, later. So keep that in mind. Very interesting. Um, he talks about pleasant people like to be alone. They don't need noise because wicked people cannot be alone with themselves since you have to spend time with an evil person and the good man finds himself happy with his own company. That's a good lesson for you. If you can't be happy in a room by yourself with no noise, you're probably a bad person. <laughs> Not going to sugarcoat that one. You're probably a bad person. Um, this is what I give. I tell people to do the uh, driver's test. We just drive without your radio on, without your podcast on, without your music on. Just drive the car alone in your mind as you're driving. If that's too difficult for you, I'd fix that ASAP because it means you're a bad person. <laughs> I laugh, but I mean, it's Aristotle, right? You're just, hey, you're probably just a wicked person. You hate being with yourself. You hate being alone because you're with yourself and that person's terrible. Um, the happy one, happy man is the one who is good. He has virtues. He acts right, right in accordance with good reason. Um, this makes a man good, which makes him beautiful. Beautiful things are desirable and cause pleasure. The virtuous man is happy with himself because of that beauty. Since man and man enjoys spending time with other good men, and thus we can say that it is definitively the best life. Um, and again, there's like an asterisk because we're going to talk about contemplative life later, since that turns out to be the really best life. Um, and Aristotle points out, but some people say that we need to have good fortune um, to be happy. Um, and so he goes, because how can we be happy with all the bad stuff? And that's section 1.9. And now the hour is over. If you want to leave, feel, feel free to leave. Um, but now I will take questions. We will end here and pick up on 1.9 next time. Yeah. I was going through how to win friends, influence people earlier because I was make, I want to make friends at the pro-life march. Maybe realize things are universal. That is very true. It's absolutely true. Um, let's see. Ice cream is good. That is true. Fair enough. Um, man enjoys spending time with other men. <laughs> Us. <laughs> good. Su oh, yeah. Bona monkey. I just realized, yeah, if you're sitting there realizing you hate sitting alone with your own thoughts, you are the person Aristotle is saying needs to sort his stuff out. How do I sabotage the radio and the cards of others? You should probably ask Mez. He probably can figure something out like that now. He has those skills. <laughs> is it true that if you like ice cream, you're a cat? That's funny. Um, oh, should. I thought you wrote how. Because I will. <laughs> Mez. I mean, he jumps around, Mez. Because, like, sometimes he goes, hang on, we need to stop. So the Greeks like to write with appositions. And it's very apparent. He likes to stop the dialectic and kind of like, hang on. Let's, uh, let's talk about, um, let's talk about these other ideas. We got to lay out really fast. 
which is what he does in a lot of chapters. Uh, are there any other questions before I hit it, hit the recording, or turn off the recording? In the hypothetical silent drive, does singing along with the songs that are constantly playing in your head make you a bad person? Um, that feels like I would talk to a professional about why songs are constantly playing in your head. That seems like you need a that, that's a that's you need a pro on that one. I can't help, I don't I can't answer that. One. You need a pro on that one. <laughs> I can't help you there. I can help you with a lot of things, but I'm not I can't do that one. All right. When I was a kid, people played jazz ray ate them ever since my inner model. Oh, funny. I'm making a joke. We gotta go. Thank you very much. No problem, bro. Songs play in my head too. Okay, I didn't. This this is a. Is this this is like the uh, NPC meme where it's like, do you have an internal narrative? And uh, it's like it's like there's like a, this is like the new version of it. Do you have a uh, do you have a band in your head that's constantly playing? <laughs> oh, you're not a musically inclined. You you don't have a musical person in your head. <sighs> Um, okay. Questions, questions. I see typing. Okay. Someone here thinks they're the main character. Pilgrim. All right. Unless someone else starts typing your last question. Hit me with your question. Make it good. Never, never mind. Okay. You know what? <laughs> All right. Well, then... If no one else is typing, five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'm going to call it then. Let me hit that recording. And this was a 